deep conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Welcome to Think About It, or welcome back to this episode on philosopher Immanuel Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment? Before I introduce the episode, I just want to let you know that this episode is also available on YouTube, so you can watch the video recording of my conversation with my guest about Kant's philosophy. It's available under my name on YouTube, as are many of the other episodes on the great books that I discuss in this podcast. Immanuel Kant was born in 1724 and died in 1804, and is known as inaugurating or ushering in what is considered modern philosophy. His books include The Critique of Pure Reason, The Critique of Practical Reason, and The Critique of Judgment, which, as their titles say, are the attempts to understand the relationship between reason and experience and the pure reason, practical reason, in what we do and why we should do it, and the critique of judgment, which looks at aesthetics and teleology, or why we do things with what goals in mind. He also published The Metaphysics of Morals and several other books. He was born in Königsberg, which is today Kaliningrad in today's Russia, and back then was part of Prussia on the Baltic Sea. He famously never left Königsberg at all, but taught at the university for decades, for the first 20 years, while getting paid by each individual student if his lectures were good, which means that he talked about a huge range of subjects, which today we would classify as anthropology, history, sociology, politics, philosophy, metaphysics, alchemy, biology, etc. But what he's known for is really the critique of pure reason and the other critiques that usher in what I called modern philosophy because they try to define and identify what we do when we think and how we think and what we think about on its own terms without relying on any outside or external causes or cases. I talked to Beatrice Longness, who's Silver Professor of Philosophy at NYU, where I also teach. I was thrilled that Beatrice had time out of her busy schedule, she lectures all over the world, to talk about Kant's philosophy. She studied in Paris at the École Normale Supérieure and at the Sorbonne, and also at Princeton, where she also taught before coming to NYU. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has published many books, among them Kant and the Capacity to Judge, Kant on the Human Standpoint, and her most recent publication with the wonderful title I, Me, Mine, Back to Kant and Back Again, which examines what it means to speak from the position of the I, my personal subjective viewpoint, in ways that must be relevant for others. I was thrilled to have Beatrice join me for the podcast to understand the significance of this short essay, What is Enlightenment?, which Kant published in response to a newspaper article, essentially as a footnote to explain what is enlightenment, what does it mean for us to think ourselves. And in this short essay established not only the entire age of reason in which we still live today, but also, as Beatrice explained to me, lays out essentially in a very short and brief and concise way his entire philosophy. So please join me for the podcast now with Beatrice Longness on Immanuel Kant's What is Enlightenment? So uh, Beatrice, I'm really uh, so happy to see you here. First of all, thank you for uh, joining me on Think About It. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is very exciting for me yes. too. <laughs> so Beatrice, you're a prof uh, professor of philosophy and you have said, I've, I've heard this um, in one of your talks, that Kant is your philosophical hero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've devoted a lot of time to think with Immanuel Kant, sort of who really inaugurates what we consider modern philosophy today. And then I, I ask you to think about this little tiny text in this huge corpus yeah. of what is enlightenment. It's a sliver of Kant, really. Um, and maybe we can start there. It's such a small little yeah. way into this major edifice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, it's quite amazing, actually, because it is indeed one of Kant's, if not the text of Kant's, that is most discussed today. Right. And it started almost um, contingently. So there was this throwaway question in a footnote to an article in the, in the um, Berliner Monthly, Berlinische right. Monatschrift, yeah. where actually a, a defender of the Enlightenment 
uh, Zöllner responded to an earlier article which was really going too far, he thought, in applying the principles of the Enlightenment and said, and by the way, nobody has ever been able to tell me what exactly Enlightenment is. Right. And that generated a whole slew of answers from all sorts of people, most of them more obscure than Kant. One of them just as famous as Kant, Mendelssohn, right. and then an answer from Kant. Uh, and that answer, um, well, then sort of mushroomed, partly, of course, because the question, what is enlightenment, also touched on what was central to Kant's system. But this text doesn't really make use of Kant's more systematic thought. Mm -hmm. Initially, mm -hmm. um, the purpose of the article is to defend freedom of thought, right. and in particular to defend freedom of thought against the attempts on the part of religious conservatives to encroach upon it. Right. So initially when Kant says, enlightenment is the emergence of humanity out of its state of immaturity, and its major motto is think for yourself. Right. The, m the first meaning is think of yourself against the attempt of any authority, and especially religious authority, to think for you. Nobody should be thinking for you, you should be thinking for yourself. And it's a way, a kind of, it's not really a call to action, but he says, this is, he says, this is what human beings are meant to do. This is right? what this human, is so yeah, there's a, behind this, there is a, very general view of what there's a kind of teleological principle behind human history. Yeah. Human, given their capacities, given the capacities they all share, mm -hmm. they're all called upon mm -hmm. to develop the capacity to think for themselves, develop their reason. But that can't immediately adds that takes courage. It doesn't go right. by itself. It doesn't, it doesn't depend just on their reason. It depends on their courage, a moral. And we, moral when we leave the reason apart, that's a lot of your work is on this. How do we actually think? What are the yeah. conditions for our own thought? This is yeah. the other large part of Kant, the, the, the real, let's say, the main work. But right. in this work, when he says courage, why do we hesitate to think for ourselves? And I think this, okay. for me, this mm -hmm. question is so interesting because mm -hmm. we're in a university, I'm doing a uh, podcast. The whole point is think for yourself, which is right. such an obvious thing. And then right. your work focuses on all the other Kant. Yeah. It's actually not simple, yeah. and then, but you just said it's also, it requires courage. Why don't we just all want to do this? Um, so I think again, in all fairness, both to Kant and to ourselves, <laughs> we need to put that issue of courage in its context yeah. for Kant. Yeah. Namely for Kant, this is a very specific historical moment. It's actually important to realize that Kant was capable of thinking about his own specific historical moment. Yeah, this yeah. is the reign of Frederick the Great. Yeah. It comes after Frederick William the right. who was not as enlightened as Frederick the Great right. uh, and had actually um, um, impinged, limited religious freedom. Then comes Frederick the Great, who, who really um, endorses religious freedom, but Kant was very aware of how fragile that was. So yeah. why don't we all want to think for ourselves in Kant's time? Well, because it was not that either politically or religiously or socially easy. Yeah. How does that question then generalize to Kant's system? Well, we human beings are always occupying a particular standpoint. Okay. Uh, that's how we we're born into yeah. a particular yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very difficult. It's not obvious to grow out of that particular standpoint and occupy a standpoint from which we can, as he says elsewhere, think putting ourselves in the place of anybody else. In fact, here he says, think for ourselves. Uh, the motto is developed more fully in Kant's third critique, the critique of judgment, where he says, actually, there are three basic maxims of enlightenment. Think for yourself. Think putting yourself in the place of anybody else and think consistently. And you, if, if you think about it seriously, they actually all complete each other. Uh, thinking for yourself is not yeah. just thinking from your particular standpoint. So I'm a French person or I'm a German or I'm a Jew. or I'm, It's thinking using your reason and reason is a universally shared capacity. So we all have the same sort of starting position. We all can make use of our reason. 
That's a fantastic right. Well, we all have both the, the same starting position. Yes, yes. We are rational. Yes. Yeah, and we rational. all have okay. different starting positions. Right. We do think from Very, particular yes. educational yeah. backgrounds, yeah. particular societies, sure. and yeah. so on. That's why it's so difficult. Yeah. We have to navigate constantly the tension between those, those two and meanings, as it were. So of, that's the first one thing for you. The second one is think from the position of somebody else. Yeah, of anybody else. And these are interlinked. So this is the second point he makes right. in the third critique. Yeah, yeah. And how do we do that? <laughs> so actually, here's the interesting point too. Uh, in a way, it has already happened, thinking from this, or mm -hmm. at least we've already been given the tools for that. Mm -hmm. That Kant's famous appeal to the Copernican Revolution in Which the preface he to his first critique. he himself says, I am initiating... I, I am going to initiate in philosophy what has already been done in science. When Copernicus when re yeah, the universe when, from not us to the sun. Right. That we revolve around yeah. the sun and we are yeah. in movement. Right. And but yeah, and that actually, that, that's a more complex thought than one might think. Because what the Copernican revolution actually uh, initiated, the idea, the way we most immediately see things mm -hmm. depends not on the way they are, but on the standpoint we occupy with respect to them. So, for instance, it, it seems obvious that planets revolve around the Earth. But once you realize that the Earth itself revolves around the Sun, then you realize that the apparent motion mm -hmm. of the planets, for us, depends on a moving standpoint right. we ourselves occupy. Right. Right. And Kant says, well, we have to think more generally that the way we think depends on capacities we have that are universally shared. Okay. And what those capacities that we universally share allow us to understand is how at any given time our immediate standpoint is relative, is relative particular. To whatever we are reflecting on or acting on right. or, or thinking, thinking about. Or whatever position we yeah. ourselves are in. Yeah. Yeah. So the second plus, so, you, so even assuming the other's position is not as easy. Right. Which is interesting because it's such a common Thing today. Yeah. Or think how other people think or take the position mm. of somebody else. Well, mm. that's not a simple thing, but we're capable of it. We are capable of it. And of course, to think putting ourselves in the place of anybody else is not adopting their standpoint. Yeah. It's just understanding, okay, how do how do our respective standpoints communicate? Yeah. Yeah. And how by assessing the difference in those standpoints can we arrive at an objective standpoint? A standpoint that would hold for all. So it's kind of a triangulation, so I'm thinking, so we're looking at the same table here, the mm -hmm. same cameras, the same mm -hmm. room, mm -hmm. but you're looking at it from a different position. Mm -hmm. And in this, do I think about your position both just physically in space, but mm -hmm. also who you are? Do I try to imagine all of that right. as well? Right. So how you would see this, and I think I right. look at it this way, you may think of it that right. way. Right. We could exactly. But so in the case of this table, it's fairly easy because we're not that far from one another. Right. Right. Uh, the table <laughs> be belongs to our common physical, directly right. <laughs> physical space. It's already more complicated in the case of science. Yes. So science is a very good model because in the case of science, you know that you've reached as objective a standpoint as you're able to reach at a certain point mm -hmm. in the development of science mm -hmm. when you're capable of understanding a particular phenomenon or a particular event under a universal law. Okay. And that is what it is not to believe something to be true because you've been told it's true, but because you understand it under a universal law. So here's a simple example. Um, I may have been worried when I, I mean, I was worried about everything when I was a child, I still am. <laughs> but for instance, mommy, isn't the moon going to fall on the earth? No, no, it's not going to fall on the earth. And I just believe her because I love her, because I trust her. And then at some point, I learned the law of inertia. I learned the law of universal gravitation. And I understand why the moon is not going to fall on the I'm earth. I'm trying to follow you and I'm thinking, I didn't know the law of inertia yet. <laughs> I'm trying to think, why is it actually this way? Well, you yeah. just gave me a cause for alarm. I think, well, why <laughs> Well, we got, you know, so the moon gravitates around the earth. The, the, you know, the, that's a very famous example. The pear falls from the tree, yeah. both according to the law of universal gravitation, but in the case of the moon, because in addition, so it's, it's subject to that law, but also to the law of inertia. So it keeps on that moving counters on that it keeps it elliptical moving around the earth. So you now have, so, you, you now have a shared 
understanding based on objective right. rules I have, or yeah. laws. I have a universal law yeah. both from an objective standpoint. So th these different phenomena actually obey the same law. Yeah. And I also know that any other human being, that, so that's another sense in which it's universal. It's objectively universal. Yeah. It can also be understood as universal by any other right. human being that has yeah. been taught yeah. the law, so taught the reason for the validity of the law and can exercise the reason. And the, the third part way. you said it has to be, the reasoning has to be consistent or follow a certain kind of, yeah. you have to be able right. to reconstruct. And so you... Yeah. And also, again, um, if I encounter phenomena that seem to contradict each other, like the falling on the, of, the, the, of pair, the pair yeah. and the gravitation of the moon around the earth, right. I may think, okay, no, there's something wrong there. No, no. And now I understand why there, there's an additional law. Okay. Um, so this is an important part. So, it's, so yeah. to go back to this, it's not you just accept this because someone tells you. That would mean not thinking mm. for yourself. He yeah. uses really, really kind of um, sort of paralyzing examples. If you hand over all authority for your own life to everybody else, the doctor tells you how to mm. eat, someone else yeah. tells you what to believe in, someone else tells you what to think, you're not thinking for yourself. Right? Right. Although, of course, we should talk about expertise. You want some experts to tell you yes, certain exactly. things, right? He doesn't say yeah. throw all this out. Right. So the other two parts are very important. So when a doctor tells you something, yeah. you can say, I can follow the logic mm. of this because I know mm. there are rules that this doctor, yeah. she applied. Yeah. And thirdly, there's a consistency in which they've been applied. Right. So this is, he doesn't quite unfold all of this here. He mm. just says, think No, he for doesn't think here. For yourself. That's why, yeah. He yeah. just says, think for yourself. And that's when we, what does that mean, think for yourself? Because it might mean, well, I'm just going to think according to my culture. Or I'm just going right. to think according right. to what I've been taught. And that's right. not what he, and that would be a way of focusing on yourself as this particular person right. at this particular time in this particular community. And that's not what he means. Mm -hmm. He means, no, no, yeah. think for yourself means using a reason that is yours, a capacity that is what most fundamentally characterizes you as a human right. being. And, and then you can share that with others. And, and this other, part, yeah. it's character, it characterizes you as a human being. He says, this is the essence of what it means to be human, right? Yeah. To be able to use reason. Right to shape your yeah. understanding of your yeah. sense impressions or mm. of you seeing the world, you, you're able to mm. use reason, right? And he also says that um, you have to use reason. It's an obligation almost. I'm mm. kind of interested. In so yeah, that's, yeah like, no, that, that, that is really the interesting point. So um, in fact, this idea that, okay, you know you're using your reason if you understand something not just as this particular event or this particular case, but under a universal principle. Mm -hmm. He extends that not just to understanding what exists, but understanding what I ought to do. Okay. And, so, and there it's a much more complicated, that's where issues yeah. of community come in much more right, forcefully. Right, right, right. Um, but what I ought, to, he includes under what I ought to do, the obligation I have, the moral obligation yeah. I have, to be objective about what is, about facts, right. and to accept laws for my own action only if I can accept that others would, would give them to themselves right. as well. So there, there are those two aspects. What you, uh, can, what you can know and what you have to do. Yeah. So you can, kind of yeah. the link between, between reason and what we call morality, I guess. Right, in morality policy. and um, political choices. Okay. Um, social obligations one acknowledges to others, limitations one acknowledges to be necessary on one's own free willing right. activity. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And this is the other part, we'll, we, this is the categorical imperative, which I think mm -hmm. is the other thing that, ever, that mm -hmm. a lot of people know about Kant, that's mm -hmm. sort of the two things they take. Mm -hmm. sort of, it's enlightenment, categorical mm -hmm. imperative, and then you're kind mm -hmm. of, then it gets really difficult, so mm -hmm. then you leave it to philosophy. Yeah. But what you just said, that it's a rule that others could apply yeah. as well. Yeah. Act only according to that maxim, whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. I wanted to say something yeah. about the case of the medical doctor because I find yeah. it really, really amusing when one knows a little bit about Kant. Yeah. Uh, because Kant was very, very concerned about his own health. 
And it, it's very interesting. I mean, th those little throwaway remarks, <laughs> you, you have to consider them in context. Kant was not a very good physical health, yeah. and he didn't leave it to anyone. Uh, he probably did see doctors, yeah, but yeah. when he says, I'm not going to leave it to them to decide for me, he yeah. took his regular walk. He was very careful about what he ate. In yeah. a way, he anticipates what is today a, a very common, you know, just, just live properly. Self-care, so right? Yeah, yeah self-care. Well, he's famous, I, I mean, I grew up with these, I don't know if they are true or not, or apocryphal, but that he took this constitutional walk. Every yeah, day. so People it's not clear whether it was really him, whether it was a legend or his friend Green. Oh. He had a very good friend, Green, okay. England, English, yeah. who came regularly to visit him, taught him Hume. Oh, really? And it's not clear whether it was Kant who took the condition, or maybe they both took it together. But they said you know. could set your watch or your clock yeah, by the time by Kant the time took his Kant walk would, and everything yeah. was this rhythmic kind mm. of... I also think there's this kind of um, incredible productivity, because he was teaching full-time yeah. for yeah. decades. That, yeah, that was the regime for, for German And then he wrote yeah. these books mm. which have really revolutionized the mm. way philosophy can think mm. about itself, right? right? This is what he, this contribution yeah. is. To go, so when he says... Um, it's very easy for others to establish themselves as the guardians, as those mm. who think for us. Mm. So some people realize that it's not easy for us to, that we want to think for ourselves. Right. And maybe we don't want to. Yeah. There's also this kind of temptation to say, oh, it's, yeah. it's not, what you just laid out, mm. it's not as simple as it seems. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some people shrink away from it. And I think there's this kind of, this is what's so interesting about this text. It's this kind of admonition to humanity. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean be yourself, be human, right. which means you have to think for yourself. Right. And of course, for Kant, it all uh, boils down to being free. So yeah. why should I think for myself? Because that is what it is to be free. Any other freedom, and it's not the only freedom, yeah. but any other freedom will depend on that. Okay. Uh, and if that comes up at the end of the text when, <laughs> you know, he's a little bit too, I think, um, accepting of Frederick's more um, authoritarian yeah, tendencies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the, but at the end he says, look, once human beings have been trained to think for themselves, then they will also be able to demand self-government in a political sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the first, so yeah, why think for yourself? Because, because it's not just that uh, it's in human nature to be rational, it's that human beings think about it. What they want is to be free. Well, and what is it to yeah, be yeah. free? Yeah, it's yeah. first to think for yourself. And then everything oh. else can come into the... But that's probably the most powerful sort of idea in this little text, mm -hmm. that when human beings think for themselves, they want to be free. Mm -hmm. That freedom is the essence. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word, philosophically right. speaking, but it's kind of innate to us yeah. to be free. Right. And he also says in a way, we don't have to be freed by anybody else. Mm -hmm. we, will, we will, in a sense, discover or realize our own freedom, right? right? It's not given to anybody. It's not coming from right. elsewhere. It's in, yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know if the philosophical term would be, it's innate or in, of, in us. So at least it's a capacity we have. So there okay. too, yeah. uh, Kant's thought is always more complex than one might think. <laughs> right. it, that's also why it is so easy to attack. Because oh, you, can, you can draw this, or draw that, or draw that. Um, so Kant has a very, and too often ignored, I think, developmental view mm -hmm. of human capacities. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. or what, we, what he himself calls epigenetic. So there are... Um, it's not that the developed human being is already there in, in germ, right. in the infant or in the baby or right. in the um, whatever he Embryoring. understood the, yeah. in the womb entity yeah. to be, uh, but it's that there are capacities that under external, under the right external circumstances mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are apt to be developed. And mm -hmm. so it's not that any human being is born with the will to be free, it's that any human being is born with the capacity to mm -hmm. will to be free. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is the same as her rational capacity. Interesting. Um, and, is, and are there conditions under which a human being couldn't get in touch with that capacity or couldn't, ex couldn't develop it or...? Um, y 
Yeah, I think. Um, well, certainly, yeah. uh, and that's also what this text says, you, yeah. you need, so you, you first need guardians, namely yeah. legislators, external legislators, okay. legislators in the political and juridical yeah. sense, yeah. That, we, that will create the conditions for human beings. And the first is religious freedom. That was such an, right, right, a, right. A, a present issue in, in sure. you know, 18th century yeah. Prussia. But also conditions to participate in the, in the you know, social debate and legislative decisions. Um, but then there are, there are darker uh, issues that, that come up in other texts, not in this one, although you, you may see them in sort of under the lines mm -hmm. here. For instance, um, I'm trying to remember, it's in the later text. This is 1784, 1788, I think. Kant's text on the teleological principles, yeah. where he says, well, there are populations, uh, and any human being. So he had a view of the universality of the capacities right. in human beings. Right. But then there are populations which will grow in external circumstances such that they will not have developed their full capacity to rationality or even their full capacity to general activity, capacity to be active, okay. and he cites, unfortunately, yeah. uh, he will then take this back, right. but in that text, yeah. he cites the African populations, right. which um, were uh, initially came on earth in circumstances of uh, uh, easy weather, um, general circumstances that did not help them develop their the capacity way. to self-determination. And then they are forever, even when you transplant them, yeah, yeah. incapable of self-ruling. So he, he, he took it back yeah, then. But, but so there's something in here. So this is kind of the great thing, one of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But this is, means that it shows up later on in Hegel in a different way, but sort of that, the, that Africans, in his view, which mm -hmm. he knows about through colonial mm -hmm. writings, I guess, mm -hmm stay in a childlike state or something right. like that. What you're saying, yeah. don't read this mm. maturity, which you use mm. as a term that we understand mm. to make sense of your capacity mm. for, your, mm. for your realizing your own freedom. Mm. So in this, this is not in this text, but it's complicated because in the Enlightenment, there's this promise that all of humanity yeah. can yeah. activate this potential for freedom. Right. But I think this is what's interesting, that the text is still so powerful because it conditions the world today. Mm. I would say the entire world, actually, it's not a Western mm. concept, but it's, it, it has been applied to everybody. But in it is also a problem that he said, some people are maybe not quite ready yeah. for this, or will ever get ready for this, right. which I'm sure yeah. justifies the slave trade, slavery, mm. and racism mm. for 200 mm. years. Mm. So you have that in there. Mm. So it's kind of interesting, because mm. if we you go back to the first mm. text, but then Kant says, we all have the capacity for reason. Mm. Yeah. Right? So anybody right. reading this text says, wait, you actually, yeah. well, you, you universalize yeah. here all the time about mm. hum the human, mm. right? Yeah. And so the question is, then, what, what, do, you, what do you challenge in Kant? Is yeah. it the claim that there's yeah, yeah, yeah. a capacity yeah. for universalizing? Right. Or is it the misapplication of his own, of, yeah, of his own claim? Or yeah. a very profound blind spot in his right. own claim. Yeah. But I, again, yeah. in, in the latest right. text yeah. on these issues, 1795, yeah, yeah. Towards Perpetual Peace, he did, he did come right. out against slavery. That was after the French Revolution yeah, yeah, yeah. and the French Revolution abolition of slavery. Right. So there too, there's, even for Kant himself, there's a historical context right. But for the correct yeah. application of his own principles. I think what's, why I'm asking this because it's so interesting to read a text like this and how do you account for it from today's perspective? What mm -hmm. we said very early is that you have mm -hmm. to actually, let, like, we're, we're talking to Kant here in mm -hmm. some ways. We're trying to make sense of his standpoint, yeah. right? We're putting yeah. ourselves in that position. And you're saying yeah. there's also historical contingencies. Mm -hmm. He changes in a way which is interesting. Mm -hmm. The French Revolution really changes mm -hmm. him, right? Mm -hmm. As a, a world mm -hmm. historical event, mm -hmm. which is... Interesting when he's taught as a philosopher who deals with abstract conditions, categories mm. for reasoning, but then history mm. really intervenes. Yeah. I also yeah. think it's nice that he's a philosopher who res responds to a footnote in a monthly paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of thinking yeah. of the great yeah. philosopher today reading, yeah. you know. And this is not the view of Kant. It's reading a Facebook have. post yeah. by somebody about yeah. an right. article in The Economist. Uh -huh. You say, I'm going to take this up mm. <laughs> and respond <laughs> to what is our condition yeah. today. Right.
I, I do want to ask you one thing about women in this text oh, because yeah. we talked about mm -hmm. it really briefly, and it's kind mm -hmm. of a strange moment. And actually, you were you were more. I was more uh, forgiving. Yeah, you're more forgiving than I was. Well, not really I'm forgiving, let's say, but <laughs> he says the guardians yeah. who have so benevolently taken over the supervision of men have mm -hmm. carefully seen to it that the far greatest part of them, of all men, including the fair, entire fair sex, uh -huh. regard taking the step to yeah. maturity as very dangerous and not to mention difficult. Yeah. So I'm thinking, is he saying, women have been taught to believe that it's very dangerous to think for yourself yeah. because it's just safer to have people think for you. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit, to me, unclear as he... I mean, he doesn't say anything about women after this moment in this little text. Yeah. Does he say... No, no, actually, I like... I, <laughs> we did talk about this in our yeah. conversation, and you make me read this passage, which really infuriated me, indeed, in a more forgiving way. Namely, but it had infuriated you because it initially reads, he says, women don't have this capacity. Yeah, yeah. And, but uh, what he's saying is that women have been even more disenfranchised yeah, than the rest yeah, of yeah. humanity. Which is very interesting. He says women have been sold on this idea that they can't mm. think for themselves. Mm -hmm. And he says we mm. all have the capacity yeah. for freedom and for, yeah. to use our reason. We also all have the mm. capacity to succumb to this temptation to have others think yeah. for us, right? Yeah. Right? So it's, mm. And I think for women, he yeah. says they've all been... Mm. He doesn't then say, well, mm. some women actually have mm. not accepted this. Mm -hmm. And right. as you said, there are women at this moment, right, in, in history. Yeah, and he does, yeah, he does say the entire fair sex, so that in any case was, was not quite right, even at his time. Not yeah. empirically right, probably, yeah. right? Because yeah. <laughs> you said there are women in, in France I mean, at there this are friend, time. I mean, it, it's also, that, for us, that is very, very contemporary, because today in philosophy, we are rediscovering a whole slew of women philosophers really? who have been ignored in the okay. canon. So but that's uh, actually, actually yeah. it's, I have this conversation a lot, and it's, I've literally asked your colleagues of what I should read in terms of women in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, there's Mary Wollstonecraft and John Stuart Mill. And then they don't really mention mm -hmm. Simone de Beauvoir because mm -hmm. for many reasons. Mm -hmm. And then they're kind of done. Mm -hmm. That's the canon. Yeah. And so, so the canon has mm -hmm. one woman, Mary Wollstonecraft, mm -hmm. and then John yeah. Stuart Mill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So you're saying there are many more people. Oh, yeah, there are many more, yeah. yeah. They're being discovered. Mm -hmm. But... So the Enlightenment is this, um, this little text. I kind of, I'm trying to think, is it this, um, I said earlier, an admonition, or is it sort of encouraging us to do this? And once we step out of our own immaturity, we have to then step into the Kantian enterprise and not just say, oh, I'm thinking of myself, and my opinion is the valid one. I have to think about for myself, then imagine how you think of this mm -hmm. same thing from your position standpoint. Mm -hmm perspective, etc., and use my capacity to understand how we arrive at this, this, is it not a judgment at this, opi not opinion, what would you say, at, or understanding? If it, yeah, if it's mostly, if it's considered as, as you say, subjectively determined, yeah. and be determined yeah. by my particular circumstances, yeah. it would still be an opinion. But of course, it's not just that. Um, so... It's not just I'll consider my standpoint and your standpoint and maybe that, and, mm -hmm. and, and be tolerant. Mm -hmm. It's that I can, there's, there's a normative judgment I can pass mm -hmm. because I do have, I just have to activate them in myself. I do have principles available yeah. under which I can assess each of our standpoints. Okay. So in, in terms of objective knowledge, it's the principles he thinks he has justified in the critique of pure reason, yeah. that under which then you can understand how scientific principles are possible that we can come up with universal laws, such as the classic example for Kant would be the Kant Newton's universal laws of motion. Right. But there are also universal normative principles for action. So it's not just that there's my standpoint and your okay. standpoint and their standpoint. Yeah, yeah. It's that each standpoint can be assessed under what you were just mentioning yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. For instance, the categorical imperative of morality. And the first formu yeah. very famous first yeah. formulation of the categorical imperative of morality is never act except under a maxim that you could also will to be a universal law. Uh, the principle itself never is... Never act, let's say, this is the first principle, so that's one mm. of several, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say yeah. again, what does this is, never act? Never act except under a maxim that you could also will to be a universal law. Okay. Now, the principle itself is not that easy to understand because 
You might think, okay, so whenever I adopt a maxim, then everybody else should uh, adopt it as well, otherwise mm. it's... No. Is that everybody should be able, should they wish to, okay. Okay. to adopt it as well. So it's more a negative principle. And if that's not possible, yeah. then, then you should you not adopt the maxim. Yeah. Oh, so it's, it, give me the distinction between everybody should be able to do it. So they don't for have instance, to do it. Yeah. It's not so for instance, um, suppose I, I have an exam to prepare and I, want, I need for that exam to go borrow a book at the library. That's a pretty straightforward maxim. I need the book, I should go borrow the book. Right. I need to prepare right. my exam. Right. And now you ask, so could I also will that everybody else adopt that maxim? Yes, I could. it's not logically impossible. Right. Of course, it's pragmatically complicated. Yeah, yeah. If everybody wants the same book, right. then we have to find a solution. Yeah. Well, we will find a solution. There will be a pragmatic okay. resolution to that problem. Yeah, okay. Either we Xerox the book. I mean, now we know how to do that. There's right. the internet, right, we can right, upload right. the, yeah, the yeah, volume, right. etc. In contrast, if I think, um, okay, I've borrowed the book under the condition that I returned it by such and such a date. Right. I'm not going to return it. I still need the book. Is that a maxim? It is possible that I accept everybody else right. should adopt. Yeah. No, because it contradicts the very notion of making a promise. I made a commitment to return the book. The very right. concept of a promise is just right. negated. Yeah. Yeah. So it's impossible. So then I should not. Then you should not do it. Then I should okay. not do it. Okay. So it's more. And actually, you know, we pretty much function that way. That that's also. So Kant gives this. It's not a complicated formula, but it's complicated to understand how it works. But actually, the interesting fact is, that's pretty much how we all do. So if I borrowed the book and I decide not to return it, there is a kind of unease, a red light sort of lights up in my mind. Can yes. I really do that? And the unease is because I think, because do you think we have learned to, to think, well, if everyone did that, Something, then or know, someone it, else yeah. needs the book. It's not, right. there's a rule, I'm breaking a rule. It's, it's it, that, it's, yeah. So we, and it's, it's, it's interesting what you just said, because actually that's what parents yeah. tell their children. What if everybody did that? Right. And that is actually an application of that universal principle. And Kant says at the beginning of his first sort of uh, entry into moral mm -hmm. philosophy, the groundwork for the metaphysics of moral, mm -hmm. he says, I'm not teaching you anything you don't know. Hmm. The common moral understanding does know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what is morally unacceptable is what does not heed that universal principle. It just doesn't have it clearly in right. view. And I'm just, what I'm, what I'm doing is putting out there as a clearly formulated principle, what more or less in an obscure way right. everybody knows. So why is it needed? Well, because if you don't put it clearly out there, then any sophist yeah. can come and try to corrupt. Okay. Because you the can take any example and then you have an infinite amount of examples and this one and this one and you don't know what the, right. the rule, there's yeah. no principle. Yeah. Are there other principles that he says in terms of what we ought to do? So actually is that same imperative has two other related mm -hmm. formulations. One is never act except in such a way that you take humanity in yourself and in the person of everybody else, in your own person mm -hmm. and in the person of everybody else, not only as a means, yes. not only as a means, but also as an end in itself. And what does that mean? Well, it means, of course, we, we need to treat others as means. We always, you know, in our everyday life, it's useful to me that there's a grocer right, right. next door. Right. It's a means for myself to, to get food when, right. you know, easily when I need it. Right. But you should never use other human beings, namely humanity in them, just as a means, but also yeah. as an end in itself, which is another way actually to formulate the first, namely, well, they too have a right to consent yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. to the way I act. But this is interesting to the humanity in them yeah. to recognize. So in some ways what right. we said earlier about how he a few years later makes this really offensive comment and kind of 
tragic comment in a way because it inaugurates so much where he says what if you recognize the humanity in the other mm -hmm. and don't use them only as a means to an end but mm. they are an end in themselves right. meaning they cannot just become an instrument for what they you cannot want. become an instrument and they too have a right hmm. to decide what is the proper way to treat them yeah okay so they too have a right to exercise their consent yes. to wow. the way you know right. the common way of living well, which is organized. The word you just used, consent, is interesting. Mm. I saw this play like, a few days ago called Consent, and it's some 200, almost 30, 50 years later, mm. and we're still grappling with that, mm -hmm. whether everybody has a mm. right to determine how they will actually mm. be treated mm. in society, mm. whether everybody has a right mm. to participate in this conversation, mm. whether mm. everybody can define themselves as an end rather than a means to mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting how long... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and how it's, yeah. You said there's it's another principle at work. There's the, so the, the <laughs> third <laughs> is never act except in such a way that you... So I don't remember the exact formation, but uh, that you are a citizen in a kingdom of ends. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you're a citizen in a ki kingdom of ends, it means <laughs> that everyone else that like you is a human being. The kingdom of ends is really the common realm mm -hmm. of human beings mm -hmm. as hands in themselves mm -hmm. as in themselves mm -hmm. that's the third formulation which which is actually related to this and to Kant's text in the philosophy of history namely the goal is to arrive at a universal common legislation not just internal mm -hmm. the moral mm -hmm. law everyone gives to themselves mm -hmm. but external mm -hmm. the way humanity is legislated upon and the basic principle for the legislation on human beings is that the freedom of one doesn't impinge on the freedom of okay. others. Right. Which right. means there's constraint on, one, on one's own freedom, but it's a constraint others have to accept too, right. and the commonly accepted yeah. constraint is what preserves everybody's So freedom. my freedom allows me to think of what I want to do, what I ought to do, but I also, in this freedom, I have this capacity to imagine what you want to do and ought mm. to do. And this is the limitation on my freedom, but it enables me to be human and also allows me to be recognized as human mm -hmm. by you. Mm -hmm. right. So freedom isn't this open-ended thing in Kant, right. sort of we all become free to no. do whatever we yeah. want, but we, mm -hmm. we awaken this other capacity mm -hmm. that he puts at the center of this little text mm -hmm. here to think for mm -hmm. ourselves. So the thinking mm -hmm. part in this think for yourself, for you means also this moral dimension that it's linked, and this is what Kant's project is right. in the critiques, is saying that it's yeah. not just abstract thinking, or I'm thinking mm. about the, my, it's mm. not what we consider knowledge. No, it's not just knowledge, and it's not even primarily knowledge, it's primarily the way you govern yourself and others. Right, Yeah. right. In this text, this, it goes on, it's quite interesting, you said earlier, there's freedom of religion, which is really central mm. to him. And then he says this really strange distinction between the private and public oh, yeah. use of freedom mm -hmm. of expression. Yeah. And as you mm -hmm. know, I've, I've thought a lot about freedom of speech. Everybody yeah. does, it seems. It's also one of those eternal topics uh. that recur. And he says there's something quite interesting, how we're supposed to, why it's so important to exercise freedom of expression in a public way. Because mm -hmm. it offers mm -hmm. others the opportunity to be exposed to our thinking. And also to explore that thinking to others. So yeah, it, it's, it, there's a very interesting passage where he says, um, uh, so yeah, only a few have succeeded by cultivating their own minds in freeing themselves from immaturity and pursuing a secure course. But that the public should enlighten itself is more likely. So um, emerging out of the state of immaturity is yeah. not something we will do on our own. It's something we will do by the exercise of public debate. So it's not just that I will expose others to my views, right. it's that I will submit my views to others in public debate. Um, it has those two dimensions. And this is an interesting part. There's this caricature of Kant as sort of sitting in the study and writing and going mm -hmm. to teach, but then actually he did engage in mm -hmm what we would call public debates, quite mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. The criticism mm -hmm. to his work, he responded mm -hmm. to it. He was mm -hmm. in a very active yeah. way as to the extent yeah. possible to him at this time to yeah. respond to criticism, yeah. engage, and he was teaching all the time. And he was teaching all the time. All the time. Yeah. 
the first 15 yeah. years, I think he t back then you had to, you weren't paid and you had to, t every yeah, student was, paid you directly after the lecture. Paid by the lecture, yeah. <laughs> it's quite and then system. finally he gets a position in 1770. He was already, what, 56? Yeah, 50 or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 46, 46, yeah. yeah. Right. But this um, idea that you have to put your thought out into the public, mm -hmm. it's, why isn't it just sufficient to think for yourself and sort of make up your, you know, it, through the principles or we take mm -hmm. steps we just outlined? Mm -hmm. And why is that important? Is it because it should be tested or it should be, um, you should refine it in this way? Which is ultimately this John Stuart Mill argument, mm -hmm. which is a little bit strange. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, you should put this out there to have others um, engage with it. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I think again the the small incremental views we have here get developed massively mm -hmm. in the whole system. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this idea that it is by public debate that we will refine our views, I think, is most clearly developed in the third critique, the critique of judgment, mm -hmm. where Kant says, well, he, that, that's where he develops his idea of the common human understanding, sensus communis, the very yeah, famous yeah. notion of sensus communis. He says, there are two aspects with it. The sensus communis logicus, namely the, the common sense where we make use of our logical capacities. Yeah. So we think consistently for ourselves, but we also learn to think consistently by confronting our views with those of others. And then there's this other mysterious notion of a sensus communic aestheticus, a sensible, a, a common sense that makes use of our sensible, our sensibility. Yeah. And there too, we refine our, our access to beautiful things by confronting our own sensibility to beauty, to that of others. So I think the idea that it is by public debate that we will arrive at both a better intellectual understanding and a better sensibility to what the world has to offer, as it were, and what other human beings' creations have to offer, right. is really um, uh, a fundamental part of Kant's view that we have capacities, but they will develop only under external circumstances that are favorable to their development. Right, okay. We don't develop just on our own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We develop in connection right. with the external circumstances and essential to those circ external circumstances are the ways we communicate with others. And this sensus communis, there's two parts. Is it the logic or logicus and aestheticus? Mm -hmm. The second one is the one that's interesting in, mm -hmm. when I think about that, that we should share our responses to let's say, mm. beautiful objects or experience mm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And w what, because I think that's for a lot of people really strange, like, because they say, well, I like this and you like this, mm -hmm. and this is beautiful, and then you don't think mm -hmm. it's beautiful, sort of like, what does mm. he think happens in this moment? And mm -hmm. it's quite interesting when you said much earlier, we all have this humanity, mm -hmm. or we ought to recognize in mm -hmm. others that they have their humanity mm -hmm. as an end in itself. We all have probably this capacity mm -hmm. for freedom. Mm -hmm. What do we, we all have this capacity to, first of all, to respond to beauty. Mm -hmm. That's already a big step to recognize everybody, mm -hmm. all humans mm -hmm. respond to beauty. Because mm -hmm. I think there's so much mm -hmm. talk today, what do you have in common, a shared yeah. humanity. Yeah. But he actually wants to really understand what mm -hmm. would that mean, a shared humanity. It's not a shared set of values. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then, Yeah, so it, yeah, it, the, I think the response to beauty is really an interesting case because uh, here the idea is that we don't just have a rational capacity that's common to all. We right. also have the capacity to imagine, yeah. imagination, yeah. Yeah. Um, create visible, audible, um, smellable right. entities, reality, um, that we have, as it were, imagined from the free play of our own capacities and right. then put out there in the world yeah. as an expression of what we are. Right. And, um, that is, that ends up being for Kant the first core of the way we communicate with each other. And I think it's very prescient because if you think of the development of art, for instance, in the late 19th and early 20th century, yeah, yeah. the discovery of African art, yeah. um, 
out of faraway cultures and regions right. became essential to the development of Western art. Right. Uh, and Kant, Kant had foreseen, even though those arts come from such different communities, right. cultures, geographic conditions, they, they become an essential element of the sort of universalization but of culture. What's essential is that all human beings, all cultures have this capacity and urge for self-expression through beautiful, mm -hmm. through the mm -hmm. creation of beauty, mm -hmm. which is not utilitarian, it's not mm -hmm. a shared project mm -hmm. to develop mm -hmm. a society, but mm -hmm. all cultures produce mm -hmm. something. So what, you, what we're recognizing is this other culture mm -hmm. produced something mm -hmm. they value greatly, but mm -hmm. not in a utilitarian sense, mm -hmm. because it's beautiful mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to then I can, I get a sense that they have a capacity that I have in myself, right. although I may not have yeah. the same response to yeah, it. Yeah, right? and initially the response will be very different. Very different, right, because yeah. I don't get And it. in fact, Kant does give examples of that. You know, the, the, yes. the young poet who will love his own poetry and others tell him it's, it's, it's <laughs> right. yucky, it doesn't have any value. And, <laughs> no, no, no. and then eventually either he will change his mind or they will change their mind. Interesting. And the question is, and how, how does that happen? Well, again, by talking. By talking. Yeah, right. So you don't say, look, you say, but look at this and look at that and look how it works and this is why I find it. And you will never, so Kant's view is, you will actually never exhaust an aesthetic experience just by explaining it. Right. But you, right. will, you will go some way to mm -hmm. putting others in a position to share it with you by communicating what it is you're seeing or what it is you're hearing or what it is, yeah. Essentially, what it is, the examples he gives are mostly poetry, visual arts, and it's, music. It's nice the example is that the young, enthusiastic poet who mistakes his own art for something amazing, mm -hmm. or Kant has this category, he says, or he's a genius mm -hmm. who yeah. gives the rule to mm -hmm. his own art, mm -hmm. and we don't understand anything. Or actually, it's it's nature in him. Yeah, nature so in him. Something oh, that's he right. doesn't so control. It's, yes, nature correct. in him gives the rule to his art. So through yeah. this this artist. Mm -hmm nature imposes mm -hmm. new rules which we can't mm -hmm. understand right now mm -hmm. because and this is also in our historical moment mm -hmm. this person will be un misunderstood mm -hmm. but since there are rules mm -hmm. through nature given to this work mm -hmm. eventually uh, it will be understood because those rules will become those that everybody mm -hmm. recognizes as the right rules or as mm -hmm. rules in, in themselves mm -hmm. but the genius is this kind of um historical being because they're out of their own time and, and in some ways this is the whole romantic becomes all the romantic poets I can name now are all these people mm -hmm. half of them misunderstood half of them forgotten and then 200 <laughs> years later they are the greatest artists mm -hmm. so there's a kind of strange dimension how it opens up mm -hmm. historical time in a completely mm -hmm. strange way mm -hmm. so when you said earlier he is a historical thinker in his moment but the categories he he uses allow us to think that we're not caught and trapped in this moment in 1784 in the Enlightenment. Mm. We're not caught, but actually he allows you to think about work in a much broader sense. Mm. Mm -hmm. I do think about this experience when you go to the theater. I went to the theater recently and I saw a play, a widely acclaimed play, and I'm sitting in a theater with 900 people and I thought it was just one long cliche in mm -hmm. a bad sense. Mm -hmm. And it was a very alienating experience. I didn't mm. enjoy it. I didn't think, oh, I'm mm. superior to these people. I actually felt really, mm. I didn't share this common sense mm. of, mm -hmm. of pleasure in mm. a beautiful product. Mm. I thought, I actually, it was very mm. isolated, not in, not in a way that, oh, I get it, they don't get mm. it. No, I thought, I don't, what, what is wrong with me? Mm. <laughs> this is, oh, really? Yes. But sometimes you could, you could think, oh, sure. No, I didn't like it. I, I didn't see. like this yeah. experience. I mm. thought it, would be, it should be a very long German mm. word for that experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Displeasure or not feeling part of the census <laughs> communis or something like that, you know. Like, uh, <laughs> So, and to go back to one other thing here is, did you, uh, your glasses? I lost my glasses. I can do without them, that's okay. There's something else um, where he says that people who have positions, are they your glasses? Oh, uh, thank you. People who have a position. <laughs> I, I knew I was gesticulating too much. <laughs> I always do. <laughs> should exercise their jobs like officers or um, soldiers mm -hmm. or tax collectors. They can have strong opinions or the priest even can have strong opinions mm. on the doctrine of the church. But Kant somehow says we are capable of doing our jobs while mm. we can publish works questioning all the principles we're, mm. we are 
we are implementing. Mm -hmm. This split seemed really complicated to me. It, I'm not sure what you're you could have about. a job mm -hmm. and you could be a priest and you mm -hmm. sort of you conduct a service every mm -hmm. Sunday, but you can write mm -hmm. a book and say I'm questioning all the premises mm -hmm. of the church. And even the priest could do that. Yeah. So Th that as long as he's preaching, he should, you know, he, 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 he's, he has an institutional role yes. and should be in the role. Yes. But outside his, his preaching, he's, he's, you know, he's free to, to... And he seems to say even he's free, and also it's a good thing. Actually, and it's a good he's thing. exercising that's, his that's reason what he in this should public do. way, and he should, yeah. write, these, and he should yeah. write books. Right, yeah. It's, it's a very str it seemed to me a um, kind of precarious distinction between the yeah. public function of your job as a private person, you're writing things, but for the yeah. public. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I know people, f maybe I'm, I'm, I have a blind spot myself. I do see the problems that can arise. And of course, in, in times of, of shift in, yeah, the, in, yeah. in the society, they do arise. And, but I, I, can, I can kind of make sense of the view because Look at the examples he gives, um, the tax collector, mm -hmm. um, the, the officer in an army. Mm -hmm. And the, so the more complicated one is the priest indeed, but then the tax collector, his role is to be a tax collector. He's right. going to collect the right, taxes. Right, right. Um, similarly for the officer. And then outside his function, he is a citizen. Now, of yeah. course, yeah. it's not that simple because a tax collector who then write, goes on and writes a book against taxes, he's going to have problems. It's, it's not going to be that but, easy. Right. Uh, I think the, the, the example he really has in mind is, is the case of the priest, because mm -hmm. there was, of course, that, that um, fairly uh, commonly shared view among Enlightenment people, mm -hmm. including Enlightenment priests, like like Kant's friend Zöllner, who mm. is the originator of that footnote. And by the way, nobody has been able to tell right, me right. what Enlightenment is. And he said is. the Enlightenment is going uh, too far, right? This is and he said there that the Enlightenment was going too far because some young, enthusiastic Enlightenment guy had said, oh, we don't need priests to, to uh, officiate in weddings. And even perhaps the institution of marriage should be abolished altogether. And then Zöllner <laughs> said, oh, God, oh, wait, wait, wait. Too much don't Enlightenment. Go that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But nevertheless, but even for people like Zöllner, there was this view that um, the, the, the truth of religion is a moral truth. Mm -hmm. and, so, and Kant's view was, well, if a priest thinks that the truths of religion are moral truths and religion should be assessed from a moral standpoint, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he has a right to write it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He doesn't have a right to preach it. Yeah, yeah. So I agree with you. At some point, you know, if he really writes the book, he, yeah. he may also be led to have to... But do you think it comes out of a sense that Kant says, if he wrote anything different, it says, you're a priest, you kind of check your beliefs at the door, mm -hmm. you never talk about them. It would not be recognizing... It would turn people into sort of robots and not allow this humanity, which he considers so central. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, if he had said, well... You can think for yourself, but if you're a tax collector, you never have. To, you cannot have another thought. You cannot be critical. Mm -hmm. What we call critical thinking. So mm -hmm. in some ways, it would be. Well, this as a tension. tax collector, that's what he says. Yeah, in in your role as a you, tax you collector, tag, you collect taxes you, you, all day. You go but and then collect at your taxes. Five o'clock when you're done, you can write a book and mm -hmm. question yeah, the whole no, system, right? Yeah. But in some ways, if mm -hmm. you didn't allow for that, mm -hmm. is there a worry in Kant? Then you then you fail on these other things, and you don't recognize the capacity, the human capacity, or mm -hmm. you use people only as a means because then they're only tax collectors. Yeah. And ultimately, that goes against the entire mm -hmm. idea Then you're only a tax collector. So I have to keep that space right. open for you. Yeah. You're also an end in yourself. Mm -hmm. and you may have very different opinions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's yeah. interesting be, and it's a question that's with us. I mean, actually, we're mm -hmm. living in a country right now where we have military officials Saying, are, saying it, things and, you know, the president who has the executive power mm. says something different and we don't know, mm. but it's, they will mm. be fired, they will not be fired. Do mm. they have the right to say certain things? Mm. They cannot question an order, right. but well, can they although, question the principles yeah. or is the order mm. in accordance with the principles? I mean, mm. we've had this through the history of, of modernity, whether there's such mm. a thing as war crimes, mm. whether a soldier can actually do something on his own act, and then, and then he can be sentenced for it because he was exercising the wrong judgment. Mm -hmm. So Kant's principles would allow mm -hmm. something to parse these kinds of difficult questions. Mm -hmm. Right, right. 
No, that's true. I, I still find it, I mean, so he, he, he's actually quite complex in his description yes. because he says, however, if a priest thought that what he's asked to preach by his church is actually contrary to his assessment, he should, then he has he no should, choice he but to. Quit. He should quit. He should quit. Yeah, 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 yeah. he yeah. should quit. So it's not, so he does think that um, there are elements that are relatively neutral, yeah. you know, that are just, you know, yeah, they're part of the, the, the community's sort of culture, so you can, right. pre you can preach them as long as they do not go against right. your moral assessment of the, of the religion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly, I mean, that's how he systematizes his own view in the later text, Religion Within the Boundaries of Reason Alone, where right. he, he, you know, uh, said, okay, there are those doctrines, they're okay, and they have this more fundamental truth that, that right, sort of is, right. we should really care about. But what I like in sort of the work, you know, your work on, on judgment and this kind of the, the difference between speaking from the eye as a personal position and a universal position, and then this example right now about the priest, there's a moment when the priest should quit. Yeah. Because he can't reconcile yeah. his yeah. criticism with the doctrine mm -hmm. of the church with what he has to do. Mm -hmm. It goes against a more fundamental, mm -hmm. and it's not as it goes against a fundamental personal preference as prejudice, but it goes against the categories you laid out much earlier of these steps in how to think for yourself, mm. which are several steps. It's not just, oh, I have this opinion, I don't, mm. this is goes mm. against the opinion. Mm. And what I like in this, in your work that Kant can appear as a kind of so principled and there's three mm. steps and there's categories mm. and I said it, mm. it looks dry, but actually it animates mm -hmm. these things we live through every day. Mm -hmm. that they actually animate yeah. and, and awaken in us to say, I can actually make sense of this rather mm -hmm. than I have to appeal to some rigid set of rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, there's a way mm -hmm. in which Kant can, can come across as being rigid, but what you're saying, it opens up this capacity mm -hmm. to think, when I say I, do mm -hmm. I speak for myself? Do I speak mm -hmm. on behalf of, a, mm -hmm. of sort of a universal morality? Mm -hmm. And of course, in many, many cases, you just speak for, so if I say, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm speaking for myself and nobody else. <laughs> right. So yes. the, 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 this tension between the particular and the mm. universal, it occurs in very specific cases. I think this is true. Right. I ought to do this. Yeah. Um, what's really striking in those two cases is that I think this is true. It's most individually about me. I've made the effort of assessing the reasons. Yes. But because I've made the effort of assessing the yes. reasons yeah. in saying I think, I also make a claim on others to examine in the same way and realize that, yes, they, they yes. ought to think I'm that actually, too. Yeah. Yes. Same thing for I ought to. I ought not to um, break a promise. Yeah. yeah. But you shouldn't either. Right. In this case, this is true under a principle that holds for all. And this is what you lay out. That sort of when you say, I think this is true, it's not saying I am right mm -hmm. based on because it's me. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, I think it's true because I've done the work to understand how I arrived at this conclusion. Yeah. And this re-examination is kind of to right. go back on yourself and say, I'm going to look at myself yeah. now, not just as having a preference. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you a totally different question. How did you get into... You said your example was, I don't know if it was your example, that the moon could fall or something. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> like, how did you discover Kant as your philosophical hero? <laughs> oh, <laughs> how did I discover? I think first, actually, through the philosophy of science. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a very autobiographical thing here. So I was, I was trained in France. I prepared for the Economie Supérieure exam. And we had the transcendental aesthetic in the program. And so I studied Kant's theory of space and time and its relation to the science of the time. And I found it completely fascinating. That's okay. how I really got into Kant. Wow. And I okay. discovered... To the science of his period. Yeah, the 17th, through, who, yeah through his, yeah. Yeah, his interest in science. Yeah. And it's funny because um, I, I'm just thinking that, trying to answer your question, I think in my own biography, I had kind of the same transition as Kant had. So Kant said, um, until I discovered Rousseau, I thought science was what was most important. And then I discovered Rousseau, so he discovered Rousseau okay. 
I think shortly after Rousseau published Les Mille mm -hmm. and uh, The Social Contract. So this is 1760s? Seven, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. Les Mille was, I think, 1758, yeah. uh, Social yeah. Contract, 1762. And um, Kant said that in 1764. So he read it really. No, French was a lot, you know, sure. the French culture was yeah. the culture of, of Frederick the Great, right. Berlin. So they right. all read French right. Enlightenment as it were, they, you know, they, they imported it the up. Enlightenment yeah. from, fr yeah. from France and Geneva. And, yeah. and he <laughs> says, when I discovered Rousseau, I discovered that he, he had already had thoughts about, you know, uh, yeah. the universality of moral values, but he yeah. thought they were based on feeling. Um, and then he discovers Rousseau and he, he says, discovering Rousseau made me think, no, the most important is human dignity. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And mm. for me, in a way, when yeah. you ask, so yeah. Yeah. What, what, how did you enter Kant? For yeah. me, it was first the philosophy of science. And so, actually, to be completely honest, I was never that much into Kant's moral philosophy because I myself have some reservations. So, I don't know. Um, I have some reservations about the f what I took to be... I'm, I'm also coming, getting back on that, actually. Uh, the, the, what I talk to be the formal universalistic uh, formalism yeah. of Kant's, okay, right. of Kant's uh, universalist claims. Um, so yeah, I think my itinerary was, was kind of circular. I discovered Kant's philosophy of science and I became interested in Hegel. Mm -hmm. And being interested in Hegel, I went back to Kant mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have this more complex approach yeah, to Kant, yeah. not just as the philosopher But it's nice science, that it's like a moment of Rousseau for him. Yeah, and for him said, it's a moment of Rousseau. I mean, yeah. what's remarkable at the early works is that he's, he writes about everything. Mm -hmm. And that today you think that anybody would write about just about everything, the cosmos, yeah. science, yeah. morality, politics, mm -hmm. everything. That this, we don't, it's rare to have people like yeah. that. Yeah, no, it doesn't. So in that sense, in that sense too, Kant is the man, man of the Enlightenment. You know, the, right. the French Enlightenment people, they were the encyclopedists. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, we should have an approach to all aspects of human experience right. and uh, the productions of human reasons and what human reason as a capacity right. Can, right. can accomplish. And, and we have kind of lost some of that, yeah. It's interesting, we have lost some of this because we do compartmentalize mm -hmm. so much. And we think yeah. someone does this and someone does that. Yeah. And with this text kind of, mm -hmm. it's such an ambitious thing to think, think for yourself in all these different yeah. areas. Yeah. Um, that, mm -hmm. Which I always thought is also the essence of education in a way, mm -hmm. that this, in, in German these words are pretty much of Cleon, a sort of mm -hmm. an interesting word, it just means elucidation or that's what you do in mm -hmm. teaching. Right. But mm. I always thought teaching is the awakening in someone else of their capacity mm. to think, yeah. not t giving yeah. them information. Yeah. Now, yeah. and that, there, that's also a point Kant stresses here. What's important is not to give information, is to teach people to think for themselves. Right. Yeah. Right. Is there a favorite text that you have? Because I gave you this, the, the littlest text, this little sliver, but it just mm. had this afterlife. It's amazing that this text yeah. has everybody has responded yeah. to this. And yeah. I, um, is there a favorite Kant that you've gone back to? Um, what do you as, mean? as a text that you think is a good entry um, into Kant, yeah, gateway drug or something like that. <laughs> the critiques, you mean to I think, teach? are very daunting. I think very daunting. No, I think in general, for people who want to, let's say, take the step after this short little text, they read this. What's the next thing you should read? The Metaphysics of Morals or the? Uh, <laughs> you know, I. I think they should just read the critique of pure reason. Read the critique of pure reason. Even Start though, there. Yeah. and yeah. actually, um, again, so one has this vision of the critique of pure reason, and it is, of course, it's true. This huge systematic text, right. but it starts with claims that are very much like this: our age is the age of critique. Mm -hmm. Nothing mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. escape critique. Mm -hmm. Not the religious powers, not the legislative powers, not the political powers. Mm -hmm. Our age is an age of examination by reason. Now. The Critique of Purin is a daunting text, and I wouldn't recommend anyone try to, I mean, yes, I would recommend anyone try to read it alone, oh, but yeah, yeah. I teach it. I mean, I teach yeah. it to young people, yeah, 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 I think so. and they're enthusiastic about it. They, you know, uh, it, it, when you think, and I even have a story to tell you. So I have a colleague um, who's, is it a son or a daughter? It's a son, yeah, who's applying to college now. And um, uh, 
he was with a friend. Uh, I won't say through which town because I, I don't want to give it right, too much away. Say. But anyway, he was walking in the street and they come upon a bookstore and the friend tells him, look, this book, everything is in it. And it was the critique of pure reason. Really? really? Um, so I, I would probably... recommend just try, try what's hard. Yeah. Try what's hard and, you know, and, but, okay, if you want something more accessible and that gives you a better sense of, uh, and it's important too, definitely, and it's too much ignored, of Kant's attention to history and to his time, I would say, read the texts on history. Mm -hmm. Idea of a universal history from yeah. a cosmopolitan standpoint, Maybe, yeah. and you will be uh, impressed by some of what is said and sort of... Um, I think what it, you will be impressed how relevant it is, yeah. and you will see this is a thought of the 17, I guess, early 90s or something like that, that determined the course of history. So it's mm -hmm. these strange texts yeah. that actually play yeah. themselves out and you can say yeah. he's writing, it's a visionary ideal of something that never gets implemented, yeah. but he says at the same time the world works, mm -hmm. how someone can see as if they can mm -hmm. shape the future mm -hmm. or just see the future, it's kind yeah. of interesting. Yeah. And exactly yeah. contemporary to that text and actually to the text on enlightenment, yeah, yeah the groundwork for the metaphysics of yeah. morals. Yeah. That's what most people start Kant right. with. Right. And yes, it's a very fascinating right. text. Right. Well, Beatrice, I want to thank you. Uh, really, really, really wonderful. Uh, and well, I really am grateful that you it. read the small little text and you gave and me the whole... And there's so much more to say. And there's a lot more to say. On <laughs> Goethe said something, when you read Kant, you step into a well-lit cathedral. Yeah, there was a, there's many yeah. quotes, there's less flattering ones by the German philosophers. <laughs> right? But I really like the way you uh, elucidated uh, these, these um, principles and concepts. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank to you. you. Great. Okay, cool. Thank you.